so my name is Scott Keating. I am a product specialist at Side Effects Software, which basically means I know how to use Houdini. Um, so today I'm going to be uh, talking about uh, kind of the new features in Houdini 16 for games, which really kind of means modeling and baking, really, because um, as much as you guys probably want to do a 200 million particle simulation, you're not likely to do it inside your game engine. Um, so not super relevant to your needs. Um, uh, so first of all, if you haven't seen Houdini 16, this is what it looks like, and really it looks more or less the same, except we've got this new kind of infinite um, background here with some measurements on it, which is kind of handy. Um, but one of the really interesting things that we did is we decided to, to try and take a, an approach to get people used to using Houdini who maybe are coming from other packages and they want to do sort of standard stuff, like they want to do some standard modeling operations. Um, and a lot of people get intimidated by the node network, right? They see it, they don't know how to interact with it, it slows them down. So the first thing we wanted to do is make that sort of easier for people to, um, to deal with. Uh, and so the first step towards that is that we created um, these uh, things that we're calling radial menus. And actually, let me just go ahead and uh, change our background to the light view. It might be. Is this on the most recent version of 16, or has this been on all of 16? Uh, this should be in all of 16, yeah. Okay. yeah. Yes? How do you bring up the red menu? Yeah, so there are three keys right now. There's the X key, and the X key brings up these snapping op options. There's the V key, and the V key is more or less viewport kind of stuff. So if I want to go to a double view, or a single view, if I want to change my shading, for instance. Um, and then there's this C key, and this is sort of the important one uh, for us today. And the C key basically brings up uh, tools, a tool set. Um, and so by default, if you just open up Houdini, you're going to get this sort of set of not actually all the tools in Houdini, but sort of a nice selection of places to get started. Things like, you know, oh, I want to create um, some test geometry, or I want to you know, do some modeling using curves, things like that. Um, and so this just gives you a quick way of getting to a bunch of tools without having to type the names of nodes, more or less. Um, but tie it into this and sort of the greater idea is that uh, Houdini has a lot of nodes in it, like hundreds of nodes. And um, when you're starting out, it, it can be kind of a little tricky to even understand like what nodes do what and where do I look. Um, and so we took an approach in Houdini 16 where we could say like, well, let's use this, this C key, this sort of custom key to give you a place to start looking for nodes. So just as an example, at the top of the screen here, you'll see these two um, drop downs and one is called build and one is called main. And build is what we call this um, workspace. It's what we call a desktop in Houdini. Um, and so I can go to this build thing and you'll see we've got a whole bunch of options now. There's terrain, there's games even, modeling. And when I switch to one of these, so let's say I go to the modeling desktop, you're going to see that it's going to, oh, whoever, someone here has changed their default settings, so I'm just going to go ahead, go back to light here. Um, all that's really happened is that it's changed my desktop a little bit, it's changed the layout a little bit. But the big change is that along the top of the screen, all of the shelf tools have changed. So we have just modeling tools up here now. So if I just go back to the build desktop, you'll see we've got ton characters, constraints, hair tools, all of our simulation tools. But if I go to the modeling desktop, now we have a much more stripped down version of the tool set, right? And this is just a good way to get you into the, uh, uh, sort of like an onboarding of like, where do I start if I'm a modeler? And not only that, this second, um, drop down here, which is for radial menus, that also changed. So you see it went from, um, if I go back to build, oh, it should go back to main is the default. Um, but when I go to modeling, it switches to modeling. And so now if I hold the C key, instead of that radial menu that had like all of those options, which had like effects and character and crowds and all kinds of stuff, now it just has modeling tools on it. So you can see create now has your standard sort of polygon options. Um, edges have a bunch of edge operations. And so this again gives you a real fast way of getting to tools so you can work kind of in the viewport. Um, and you can actually just select these as well. So if I want to go from to just poly modeling, for instance, 
you can see now you have an even more stripped down version of just like your typical box modeling type operations, some transforms and so on. Uh, and so the idea is to let you work um, sort of more quickly and more in the viewport so that people who are coming from other packages are uh, a little bit more um, comfortable working in Houdini. Because a lot of times you see that network, you don't know what it is, it's unusual to you, and you want to be able to work um, sort of straight ahead. Um, so let's take a look at some of the tools that are in Houdini 16. And I'll just use it in the viewport here for the moment, and then we'll get into some of the more complicated stuff just to, to give you an idea of how this stuff um, can really help you. So um, I'm actually going to go back to our modeling desktop. So um, let's just model something very simple just to give you an idea of how you can work differently in Houdini 16 than you could um, previously. So I'm just going to create a box. And really, the way this menu works is you just go toward one of these arrows, and then it opens up a submenu. And when you're hovering over one of these options, um, if you just release the key, it selects the option, basically. So um, you can do it the way I just did it, by holding it down and sort of navigating these menus. Um, but you can also do it very quickly. So if I just like swipe down, you know, I get the box, right? So the idea is to let you get used to which direction something is and, and get you. So we've sort of put a, a reasonable amount of effort into trying to avoid many nested submenus because we found by the time you go even more than one deep, you're already getting to the point where like a menu at the top of your screen is probably actually faster to get you to that point than it is to go like five menus deep. Um, but that's all um, completely up to you. Okay, so I'm just gonna put down a box. Let's say we're gonna model a toaster, okay? This is not, not the most incredible model in the world, but, but it'll show off some of the, the new features. So first of all, I can select an edge. You can see that I dropped the box here over in the network editor. Um, if I select this edge and go right, I could say, let's go to poly bevel, for instance. Um, I'll change this to round. And now I've got a nice sort of beveled edge there. Um, let's say uh, I want to start using um, uh, some other types of tools. So again, I can just bring in a box. Oops, I accidentally subdivided that because the enter key is in a different place on this keyboard. Um, and I want to cut out some uh, slots into our toaster here. So one of the new features in Houdini 16 that's really, really good is our new Boolean tool. So if you'd ever used the Boolean tools in Houdini previously, Houdini 15, 15, 5, uh, it was something called the cookie sop, and it was fine. It did, it did okay work. But in Houdini 16, we completely rewrote the Boolean sop um, to really make it an extremely powerful tool for not just modeling but for effects as well. So I'm going to show you some simple Booleans here to begin with. Um, and then just give you an idea of where we can take that kind of in the future. So uh, I'm going to cut a hole here in the top of our toaster, but before I do that, I need two. So I'm going to go to our uh, uh, modify here, grab a duplicate, and just drag it over so I've got two slots. Um, and I, I very much agree with what John was saying earlier, by the way, is that the best way to figure out how to build a procedural version of something is to actually just model it non-procedurally. Um, because even right now, if you see what I just did, I, you know, I made this piece of toast basically and I dragged it over. Um, you can immediately start thinking of relationships, right? Well, the toaster slot is maybe like two thirds the width of the whole toaster, right? So you could tie how far apart the slices are to how wide your initial box is, for instance, right? Um, and you can try and plan all that stuff up front, but it's actually much easier to just model something and then just start making notices because that's what artists actually do, right? You see proportions, you see the relationships between objects, and that's really all procedural modeling um, is. Um, but anyway, let's go back to what I was saying. So I've got these two pieces of toast here. Um, and I want to, uh, actually, I actually want to do it the other way around. I've got my toaster, and I want to go ahead and uh, cut out the toast from the toaster, essentially. So I'm going to go to my tool here. Go to subtract, grab the objects I want to cut out, hit enter, not plus because the plus key is in a different position. <laughs> Let me uh, turn off. I think I actually turned on subdivision, which I don't want to do. 
let's try that again without hitting the plus key. Uh, go to Boolean, subtract, select both of these guys, and that's the enter key. <laughs> Don't know what that is. All right. Um, nothing magical here, right? It cut it out. I think most of you would probably expect that that should work. Um, uh, but the key is really that while I'm doing this, you see that we've built this branching network now, and I didn't have to go into the network pane to do that. And you totally could, but again, we want to get away from forcing you to do that kind of stuff in Houdini if we can help it. So um, let's go ahead and add another box. And this time I'll tab box, because why not? Uh, let's cut a little piece out of the back of this toaster here because there's like a slot usually back there for doing uh, where the handle is. Um, again, just grab these two edges. I'm going to go ahead and do a poly bevel on those to make it round. Oops. Uh, let's go to round. Now I've got a nice little round edge there. Let's do the same thing, grab my toaster, go to my boolean, go to subtract, grab this guy, don't hit plus, <laughs> it's like exactly where my enter key is. <laughs> do that one more time, subtract, don't hit plus, don't hit plus this time, that's the enter key. Uh, okay, fine, we've got, we've got something. That's not so bad here. Um, and so these are just typical kinds of Booleans. I'm just doing a subtract in this case. But we also have a new kind of thing that's, I mean, you can kind of call it a Boolean, but it's sort of its own thing. Uh, I'm going to put down another box here. That's the plus key. Um, I'm just going to drag this out. So let's say I want to put sort of a base on the bottom of our toaster here. So it sits on a piece of plastic or something. Um, we also have a way we can do something that's not quite a Boolean. We're calling it a shatter. And essentially what a shatter does is uses one object as a cutting object for another object, much like a Boolean does. But rather than remove a chunk or add a chunk, it actually just keeps both pieces together. So in this case, I am going to use um, the Boolean node down here. Uh, I'm going to put it into the network editor um, just so I can kind of show you how this works. So. If I change our operation here to shatter, um, it's gonna, you're not really going to see any difference here necessarily because it's just made two pieces. But what I can actually um, do, if I move my display flag down here, is I can grab this um, piece now and move it. And you see that it's actually created two separate complete objects here now, right? Um, and so this makes for a really cool um, modeling tool because this was actually built for destruction. It was meant for shattering objects up so you could break them into millions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for millions of pieces, right? You're trying to create a brick wall and you want to smash it up. Um, um, but, you know, as people were working with this, it became kind of immediately obvious that, like, oh, wait, I can use this to do neat sort of modeling things. Like, um, for instance, this box now, if I go back to my box, um, let's go ahead and add an edge loop here and maybe, uh, oops, maybe a, another edge loop here somewhere. I'm just going to grab this face, move it down. Oops, let's grab this whole face and move it down. And if I come down to my uh, Boolean SOP now, uh, oops, I went a little too far. Let's move our whole box up. There we go. You can see that we're actually cutting out Whoa, there we go. Uh, we're actually cutting out like a, a, an interesting kind of shape here now, right? Instead of this sort of um, just a box shape. And in fact, I could take it even further and maybe I would just like bevel just these two guys just to make a kind of a little bit of a rounded um, edge there. And let's increase the number of these guys. Maybe push this down a bit. There we go. So now you can see I've got this nice clean cut through here. These are now two completely separate objects. And so really the idea is to try and give you access to tools because one of the power, uh, powerful things about Houdini is that 
we don't make tools for one purpose. We want everything to be able to interact with each other, right? So this is not just a tool for destruction, it's also a modeling tool. Um, this viewport is not just for modeling, it's for all kinds of things. Um, and in this case, let's go ahead and add a, a polybevel to the end of this whole sequence here. And polybevel, oops. Uh, polybevel is kind of a cool uh, tool because obviously you can just go and select edges like you've been seeing me doing. Um, but I can also just polybevel this entire object, right? So let's go ahead and do that. But if I do that, I'm going to get bevels in places where I don't want them. So you can see like this curve here, which I just want to be a nice smooth curve, is getting a polybevel because I just said polybevel this entire object, right? Um, so again, while we're trying to, to cater more to people who are more traditional modelers, people who are just coming from other packages and they want to just grab edges and move them around, um, Houdini is never going to abandon its proceduralness, right? And so all of our tools, even though we're making the interface friendly to a modeler, they're always going to have this completely procedural back end. So uh, in this case, the poly bevel, I could go in and try and select all the edges that I want to bevel, um, but I could also use some of these procedural tools to say, you know what, ignore flat faces. So if, as I increase this flatness angle, what you're going to see, once I get to a certain point here, uh, is that some of those polybevels start disappearing, right? It's not even bothering to do them anymore. And that's because we're just saying, well, if, if the angle between your edges is less than a certain degree, just skip it. Don't do it, right? And so now you can see that I get a nice bevel all the way around all the edges that I would want without having to go and select all those edges, without having to find the edges that I want. And so now we've actually built, I mean, I mean, this is a pretty amazing toaster, I think, if you really take a look at it. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> um, but we've also built sort of a very simple procedural system. So as I was working, you saw me, I was just selecting edges and I was kind of doing things. But, but in theory, like, this is still a procedural network. You can modify things upstream. I can go up to this box. And I can change, you know, the length of it. You can see I even get kind of a neat new little edge here that I wouldn't have before um, by doing that. I could change the height of it, you know. So there, there are options here that are procedural that you can discover after you've done your typical modeling session, right? You don't have to plan these things all out in advance. I could even go up to this box, for instance. You know, this is the one that we use to cut out the, um, uh, the toaster holes. And let's go ahead and add a, a bevel to these guys. And if I come back down to the bottom of my plane, now I've got a nice beveled edge on the inside of my toaster here, right? So really the idea with Houdini moving forward is, again, to definitely to try and make um, try and make Houdini a little more accessible to people who are just learning Houdini so they can work kind of the way they're familiar with, but to never remove that uh, proceduralism, right? Because you can immediately start finding awesome ways to work in a traditional manner but still have access to all these procedural tools, like change the size of these slots, things that would be... Um, annoying to go back and fix um, in a traditional sense, right? You'd have to delete all those faces, delete the interior, redo your bevel, redo your Boolean. Um, and so just don't bother. Like, let the tool sort of work in a more intelligent fashion for you. And again, this is clearly not, you know, I mean, this is not the most incredible, uh, complicated model in the world. Um, but the reality is anybody who is a modeler knows that really all modeling is is working in small, isolated pieces that are actually quite simple and then just building things up over time. So let's take a look at now, uh, you know, something a little more complicated than this. I wanted to show you this kind of in real time, walk through the building of this network, just to show you how you can use the new uh, radial menus and desktops to get access to this stuff. But let's take a look at like a slightly more complicated concept here so that you can get an idea of where this can go. Um, uh, that would be kind of interesting from a game's point of view. So I'm just going to open up a file and we're just going to sort of walk uh, walk through this file because it would definitely take me too long to build it all the way from scratch um, but let's come in here we don't need this file node make sure we're uh, all in the right position here hit escape and let's just put our display flag down here the second wall, I'll just turn that off for the moment. Okay, so here's a, a more complicated um, kind of asset, okay? Builds a wall, a very typical sort of thing you might want to build. 
Uh, and in fact, something that is often overlooked with Houdini um, in games is that it's very good at building objects as well. So a lot of people in games, and you'll probably hear it throughout the day, and if you go out into GDC, you'll hear some talks about it as well, is the idea of using Houdini to procedurally generate things like huge environments or take a bunch of pre-built assets and place them in a level, right? So place chairs around a table, tables in rooms, rooms in buildings, that kind of thing. Um, uh, but what I wanted to show you here is how some of these modeling tools actually could allow you to build like the actual assets themselves procedurally. So outside of that larger procedural system. So this is just a network. I'm going to zoom out to show you the whole thing. Um, and really, this is it's, it's not that complicated. I'll come back. You can actually completely ignore this side for the moment and just look at this as what builds this entire network. Okay. Uh, and as a matter of fact, this section is not even being used right now because I, uh, I have that switch node in there to disable it. So let's go right to the top. Let's say I want to change the number of bricks. Now, John, I think, actually walked you through this a little bit of creating a null and putting some parameters on it. So in this case, we got this wall. Let's say, you know what, I don't want 10 bricks tall. I want two bricks tall. Or I want there to be only two bricks wide, three bricks wide, and so on. So we've got this very simple sort of procedural little system here. You can see it does some nice stuff. It puts little gaps between the bricks, and it bevels the edges so that you get kind of a nice um, look here. If I go into a shaded mode, you know, you get a nice sort of brick wall here. You get this nice brick um, surrounding the doorway. It's very simple. I can say, oh, actually, no, I want the wall to be taller, or I want it to be shorter. Um, all the typical things you would expect from a procedural system. Um, but what makes this kind of cool is, first of all, let's lower this down since I am on a laptop here, um, is that this grid node, and obviously this could be turned into an asset. I'm, I'm going to walk you through the actual nodes, but this whole thing could be an asset. Controls the size of this door. So I can change the size of a door. It just cuts a hole in the brick. This is, again, taking advantage of the new Boolean um, tools to give you a nice... You can see, even as I'm doing this, there's no... Um, flickering, there's no jittering of edges or anything like that. It's completely smoothly cutting out this hole. Um, you know, I can change the, the width of this. And so now I've got a neat little tool, a very simple tool where I can create, you know, if this was maybe a, a we have a level that's a dungeon or something, right? And so I want to create those little things with bars in it down by the floor, or I want to create doorways. Um, obviously, you could combine this with a door procedural asset as well to fill in um, this hole. And this is doing, I would willing to bet, like what you think. Like I basically have built a wall here just using copy nodes. So I literally just copy a bunch of bricks on top of each other. And then I want to cut a hole in it, right? So I start with this grid. And essentially I do a couple of neat little tricks here to turn our brick or our grid into this. And really all I did was move it so that it always sits uh, on the ground here. I did a poly bevel on those uh, corner pieces, just like I did with the toaster. I did something called a resample, and a resample just like evenly distributes points over the surface of our object here. So you can see there's points all along here. Then I do a poly extrude. Nothing fancy. And that's basically it. I do a Boolean. So let's come down to here. I cut a hole out of the wall. Um, and when you're working procedurally in the past, oftentimes you would avoid doing these kinds of things because a Boolean, in most cases, is a very unstable thing, right? And proceduralism is usually based on consistency. If I do this, this exact thing is going to happen, right? Um, and Boolean in the past has been very inconsistent. If I cut this and I move it just a slightly different way, I might get a completely different group of edges. Um, but that's not the case anymore. The new Boolean SOP is extremely powerful and extremely accurate. Um, again, you can see that I can just move this thing through here without any problems whatsoever. There's no flickering. There's no weird edges happening. Um, and that's why I can use it in this procedural way. And then over on the right side, um, and again, this takes a little while to get used to if you're coming from other places, but um, you'll see how often I sort of split my network into multiple paths. That's because... I want a very simple object to cut this hole, right? I don't want to use a big crazy object because A, it's slower, um, but B, it's more prone to weird things happening because you know, who knows if I try to cut out all those bricks individually. So on the right side, I actually just go ahead and I make a, a, a curve out of my grid. 
I do something called a sweep operation, which uh, might be familiar as like a loft or something like that, I think, in other software. We call it a sweep, where we just copy this object along this arch here. Um, and then we just put a skin on it. So we just built this um, column here. And then we use this note called a Voronoi Fracture. What's cool about this, again, is that Voronoi Fracture has nothing to do with modeling. <laughs> Voronoi Fracture, is, again, was built for, for fracturing things, right? Generally, hundreds of thousands of things, like you're smashing a building or something. But in this case, I've actually just used it to cut my, uh, in fact, let me just turn on the visualization here, to cut this object into a bunch of pieces like this. So these are all individual pieces now. And the way that works is that if I come up here and you see this, this object, for every one of these points that you see, um, it's going to put a brick there, basically. It's going to cut uh, through here, through here, through here. In fact, if I want to just go ahead and give you an example, I can select one of those points and kind of uh, move it around. You'll see how, right? Uh, yeah. So you can do neat things. I made it very even in this case because this is more of a demonstration than it is a, a real object. But obviously, if you wanted to be lo a little more natural, you could add some noise to those points and make the cuts look a, more, a little bit more interesting. Um, but in this case, we'll just leave it alone because why not? Um, and then I use polybevel. Now, polybevel was, was uh, rewritten in Houdini 15.5 to also be much more reliable and much more stable. Um, and that's why, again, I'm, I'm sort of freewheeling, throwing them in all over the place here to um, create these objects. But you can see I just created a bunch of neat bricks here. And then, generally speaking, they're just merged together. That's really, I just brought in the wall and the hole and the bricks all together. So this whole section here, which is really not that many nodes, builds this kind of neat little procedural system here. And turn off that, which is pretty nice. Um, and then typically, you know, you would put UVs on this or something and give it to an artist. They'll paint up a cool texture. It'll be awesome. But, um, of course, the problem is, is, like, wait, if I procedurally built this, I can't really give this to an artist to paint a texture on there, right? Because if I move that door even a small amount, um, I'm going to have to redo my UVs. I'm going to have to redo everything, right? So really what you want to do is, is do the UVs simultaneously, right? You don't want to have to have somebody by hand cut UVs into this thing. Um, and the reality is, practically speaking, if this is a game, you also don't even want to use this geometry to begin with because there's way too much geometry in here, right? You don't want a simple wall to have 3,000 polygons or something, right? It should be as few as possible. So that's what this chunk of the network is doing. On the right here, what I've done is gone ahead and built a low-res version of this high-res object. And that's kind of the beauty of working in this procedural way is that I can reuse pieces that I use to build the high res to simultaneously build the low res, right? So I, you saw that I used this sort of swept um, archway to create my um, bricks, right? Well, I'm doing the same thing here, um, except I'm doing a couple little operations to remove some of the polygons. So you can see that there are no, uh, hopefully you can see that on there. There are no, this is one edge from here to here. There's no points along this edge. Um, and that way when I sweep um, um, to create my wall, I create a much lower res version of the previous one. So you can see this one um, is all one piece and it doesn't have, uh, so it has way fewer uh, polygons than it did previously, especially if I just come over here and compare it to um, what it looked like before, which was this, right? So I've cut out a huge number of polygons just right there. Um, and then the, the wall behind it, I just use one giant box. And then I do the same Boolean. So I'm using the same object that I had previously to cut a hole in this low res geometry, right? You just copy the node and yeah, it's literally this wire that you see coming here just goes all the way back over to the exact same node. Yeah. So I'm just literally branching apart, almost splitting into you know high res on the left, low res on the right. Um, well, I mean, the wire is essentially is an instance of the node. That's that's what it uh, that's what it means. You can hide the wires if you don't like them. Yeah. Um, uh, but generally speaking, I would say when you start working like this, you want to keep the wires because it becomes ambiguous where you're getting your geometry from, right? 
Um, so you absolutely could. You could put down, there's a node called object merge, for instance, that can grab geometry from somewhere else and pull it into a node. Uh, or like you said, you can just hide the wires. Um, but that's uh, uh, sort of preference, really. <laughs> um, but I, I generally like to keep the wires visible because it makes it very explicit how the data is flowing through my network, um, especially if you imagine giving this to somebody else. That's when it becomes very important, right? Like if I gave this network to somebody and I had hit a bunch of wires, and then they look at it and like, wait, how did this grid even end up over here? Like, how is this even happening? Um, <laughs> Uh, so, you know, if you think about a studio environment, it's a very good idea to have, uh, to have these. But let's go all the way down to the end here. So here's the low-res version of our wall. You can see I've cut out, like, an enormous number. In fact, let's just find out exactly how many um, middle mouse button is behaving weirdly, so I'll use this guy. Um, so I've got 140 polygons here, and if I come down to our other one, I've got 3,500 polygons, right? So I've just made a way lower res version of my high res uh, mesh. And we're actually going to push that a little bit further in just a second. But the other thing to note about this is like, OK, so I've built this uh, wall. Um, but let me just turn on this node here called uh, UV Quickshade. Um, I've also automatically UV'd this object as well. So now if I come back up to my object here, so let's go to this grid, for instance and I change the size of the grid, you can see that the UVs are automatically being um, readjusted. Um, the flickering that you're seeing there, especially when I move left and right, is because we're automatically packing these UVs, right? Because you want to optimize the UV space. Um, so if I go into um, my UV um, node here, um, so you can see the, uh, the, the layout. Um, if I come up to my grid, and I'm just going to have to use the, uh, uh, the parameter editor here. You can see that it's um, automatically packing the pieces together, right? And so that's why they move around sometimes to try and optimize the, uh, the space. What node are you using for UVs? So I'm using a couple of things here. Um, let's move over. There's sort of a really interesting thing you can do in Houdini when you do operations like a loft, for instance, which is that I can actually, oh, sorry, let's move over here. Um, so let me just get to that actual place so you can see it. Uh, here we go. So I've got this um, piece that I'm going to, to sweep along here, right? I'm going to copy this thing along a curve like this. So there's actually a really cool thing you can do in Houdini where you can put UVs on the curve itself. So if I come down here, so we're just looking at this piece, right? And I go into my, uh, I go into my uh, UV view. All I've done is I've taken this, that um, curve, basically, that defines the profile, uh, and I've flattened it out. I've sort of said, instead of having a curvy thing, make a straight thing. Uh, and that's just using this node here called UV Texture. You can see I could change it to rows and columns, which basically just takes curves and measures them and lays them out in UV space. Mm -hmm. But what's neat is you can actually do more than that. And here's this little expression called arc length. And so what I did is I actually measured how long that curve is, how long the profile is, and then scaled my piece of geometry, my UVs, to be the exact same size. And I do the exact same thing for the other curve. So over here, I've got this curve. I do the exact same thing in UV texture. Here it is laid out sort of uh, horizontally. Then I use this UV transform to actually scale it up to be the correct size in real world space, right? So that's how long the curve actually is in units. It's like 12 units long or something if you flattened it out. And then when I sweep the nodes, the neat thing about the sweep node is that it's actually smart enough to take the UVs from one object and the UVs from the other object and combine them into one set of UVs. Uh, so that in the end, you get. Um, you know, what you'd expect, UVs laid out flat um, using those two objects. And so there's lots of ways to procedurally generate UVs. We're actually looking in the future to making a, a whole suite of new tools for this as well. Um, but the tools we have are very good at doing this. Yes? Is there a distortion um, coloration 
map type of thing that you can put on there and you can see where the sort other than yeah. having a checker map. So you have the, the, the UV flatten node here. Okay. Um has a uh, a visualizer called UV distortion okay. that you can turn on. Okay. And that will show you blue where things are compressed, red things where are they're expanded basically. Okay. Um uh, yeah, so you can turn that on and get an All idea. Right, cool. Cool, cool. Uh, okay, so this I think even on its own is kind of a neat little tool. You create the UVs, you create a nice brick wall. You could bake now because you have a low res mesh and a high res mesh, so you could bake that out to a texture map. And now you don't need an artist to, to paint a texture every time. You can generate the texture. You could take it into substance if you're a substance user and do procedural texturing. Uh, or you could take it into COPS, which I'm not sure if John showed you, but that's our compositor that's inside of Houdini and do sort of procedural texturing in there as well. So you could have a whole asset that does everything from build a high res geometry, the low res geometry, UV it, and export the materials sort of all in one pass, basically, um, which is really nice when you're talking about iterating maybe 20 of these, 30, 100 of these. Um, so I think this in general would be kind of a useful tool, but let's take it a little bit further now, again, just to show you how, how good the new Boolean SOP is to do something that really would have been ridiculous to even attempt to do uh, in older versions of Houdini and our Boolean. So let's take a look at our, our brick wall here. It's pretty decent, it looks okay. You know, it, it's very uh, uniform, you know, not very sort of natural looking. Um, so let's take a look at how we can make this into something much cooler looking. So I'm not going to go in. You see these orange uh, shells around these nodes. So this is something called a for each loop. Okay. Um, I don't think I really have time to go into exactly what all that means, but imagine being able to run a piece of a network over and over and over again on individual things in your network. So in this case, we have all these bricks, right? And I want to do something to every brick one at a time. And that's what a for each network allows you to do is say, I want to do this group of nodes. So this group of operations here, I want to do that over and over and over and over again on something. Okay. Uh, so again, I'm not going to go into exactly what all that means because it's not really relevant to this example. Um, I think there's, a... so let me just come down right to the end of our for each loop here. Um, so you can see what it's actually doing. So on the bottom left here, I don't know if you can see that on that screen, you'll see it's saying pass 15, 16 of 50. So basically I'm doing this loop 50 times. And it's just doing the nodes that are in there one at a time on each brick individually, one at a time basically. Um, so this is going to take a little while because I'm doing something kind of complicated in there, but um, it'll be done in just a second. There we go. And if I come down to our last node here and switch over to that part of the network, what I've actually done is I've gone in, I've broken up all of the edges um, to be a much more natural looking sort of distribution of bricks, right? Uh, let me go into smooth shaded mode here. I'm not really sure why it's, isn't my actually rendering by accident? Um, oh, now it's fast again. That's weird. Okay. Um, so now I've built this thing. It's way more polygons. Um, in fact, let's, let's take a look at how many polygons it is. Almost 300,000. Um, so this definitely could not be used in a game unless you made a game about a single wall. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but you can see now that like how we've taken this pretty generic looking thing and turned it into something way more interesting. Again, without having to bring this into ZBrush or something, which is the typical thing. Um, you could do pieces of this in something like Substance Designer, but it would be a two-dimensional object, right? It wouldn't be a fully three-dimensional object. So this sort of allows you to take those procedural concepts and apply them in 3D, right? Which is sort of the beauty of, of Houdini. So uh, let me just very quickly sort of walk you through what actually happened here and why this uses the Boolean SOP, because so, it's pretty cool. Okay, so I'm going to look at just a single brick now. So the interesting thing about these loops is when you're inside of it, it just shows you one pass, right? So that makes it really easy to debug it, right? You can just go in and see, like, how does this behave on a single thing uh, rather than waiting every time for the whole thing. But essentially, here's what we do. We take this brick, a single brick. We're going to use something called VDB from Polygons. And if you don't know anything about VDB and what that is, it's a volume basically creates a volumetric version of an object. So something that's not geometry anymore, it's uh, essentially voxels, okay? So it's a, 
It's a voxel object. And the reason we're going to do that is that it's really hard to distort geometry too much, right? Because you get weird intersections, things do weird things because geometry is points and there's a limitation to what you can do with it. The beauty of a, of a volume is that you can just cut holes in it, tear chunks out. Volume doesn't care because it's just voxel information. So all I did was I take this very simple um, volume here. I'm going to do something called a VDB reshape. And all that literally did was just sort of expand it a little bit. It just like grew it outwards. Very small amount. Then I just went straight back into geometry. And so all I did was smooth it out, expand it a little bit, and turn it back into geometry. Now this is kind of useless um, in general, but we're going to do a couple more operations. I'm going to smooth it. So now I've made a really smooth version of our uh, brick. And then I'm going to use this node called Mountain. Okay, and Mountain just basically adds some procedural noise over the surface uh, of your object. But obviously, this doesn't really look like a brick, right? We've lost its brickiness. Its essential brickiness has been lost. Now we have this weird deformed shape. So what we want to do is keep our brick and our interesting deformed shape, but just on the edges. So if I come back up here now and turn on my transform node so you can see how they overlap, if you look carefully, this this section, you know, the, the distance between the blobby part and our brick is basically where the wear should occur, right? Inside here. So we don't want to, any of this stuff. All we want to keep is what's inside the box, right? We don't want to keep anything that's outside our original brick. And amazingly, the Boolean node, even with this crazy geometry um, set to intersection, can completely, perfectly um, do that intersection. So let me actually just turn off uh, A and B and turn off this guy. So it's perfectly cut all of those polygons exactly to the ones that are inside uh, our object and only inside our object. And so now we've worn away the edges of the bricks. We've put some nice procedural noise on there. Obviously, you, you know, in a real case, you would probably want to take this further, do a more interesting noise. Um, but as a proof of concept, you can see like how nice it is that I can take that one procedure now and just say, okay, now just do that on everything in my scene, one at a time, until you get something like this, which is really awesome. Um, and then the final thing I just want to point out before I wrap up here is, again, how we can take that whole thing. Uh, oh, sorry, yeah, there's a question. Absolutely, yeah. So, so what I've done here is I've created this node called low res wall. And this is just going and getting that chunk of network. So this part where it says low res, I'm just grabbing that. So now I have two objects kind of overlapping here, right? I've got my low res wall and my high res wall. So here's my high res. Here's my low res with UVs on it. And I can now jump over to something called out. If you're not familiar with that, that's where we do our rendering in Houdini. I've got this node called bake texture. Just so this happens really quickly, I'll go to 512 by 512. Um, and this bake texture node is completely redone in Houdini 16. Um, we've made it far more friendly for people to use who are used to other packages. Just pick the things you want to export. So let me just turn off a couple here. Uh, I'll just do tangent space normals and maybe occlusion. Um, so what this is going to do in Houdini 16 is it's going to extract each of these to its own target file if you want. Um, you can actually change what that is. Here's the extract format by turning on this extract image planes. Or if you're using other things, like maybe you prefer EXRs for whatever reason, export the whole thing as a layered EXR rather than multiple files. That's really up to you. Um, but the point is that this thing is completely redone. Everything now is designed to match exactly what a game engine expects as input. Okay, so. Mickelson tangent space, if that's something that's important to you, if you're going to Unreal or something like that. Um, all these should work. You should be able to plug all these exports directly into Designer, something like that, if that's what you want to do. And as I said, if you want to use COPS instead, um, go nuts. Um, but let's just take a look here what we can do. So I'm going to, right now we have a just called UV to surface, which is the, the typical, you have a low res UV object and then a crazy high res object with no UVs. You want to project the detail from the high uh, to the low. And we can now do that. So let's go ahead 
and all this should be fine. Uh, I'll just do a render to mply here so you can see what it looks like. Um, it's also baking in all the lighting information as well, if you should want that. So here's our lit stuff. Here's our occlusion pass. Here's our tangent space normal pass, which seems a bit weird actually. It's all blue for some reason. Uh, well, just pretend that should work because it should. <laughs> not sure, not sure why it all came out blue like that, but we'll just pretend that it, it's incredible. It's the best normal map you've ever seen in your life. Um, so yes, the idea is that you could you could tie all of this now. So all of those areas that I showed you, the object level stuff, the soft level stuff, the geometry stuff, the textures, the texture baking, all of that could actually be an asset, just like one asset like John showed you a little while ago. All those networks could be wrapped up so you could just hit one button that says generate a castle wall, do the UVs, make a low res version, export both of those into OBJ or whatever kind of geometry you like, also export all the texture maps. So you could actually have a completely procedural front to back pipeline for generating geometry, um, ready to export into any other package that you might like. Um, so that's a lot of information. I know like if you're, if you're semi new to Houdini, a lot of that it's probably just like shot over your head, but uh, nevertheless, I think it gives you a good idea of the potential that's there for games for creating uh, assets and then distributing into your pipeline. Um, so I think I'm just about out of time here. Are there any questions at all? Um, I lost it. <laughs> I had one and I lost it. Let's pretend I answered it as well. That's it was really good. Answer. It was a great answer. <laughs> oh, oh, are you guys, is there any plan for like taking those Boolean nodes and maybe doing like a procedural retopology that's all quad or something like that? Yeah, we're, we're, we're looking into ways of doing retopologizing now. There are nodes that do that, uh, triangle based nodes, not quad based. Right, right, right. Um, that's better than nothing. Yeah, so that that can give you if you need a, a sort of a more dense node without those big uh, N-GON faces. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you can also do things like identify an N-GON um, using a procedural uh, way, just count the number of vertices basically, um, and then do like a remesh just on that, right? So leave everything else the same and just remesh those big um, uh, faces, for okay. instance. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yes, we are in the future looking at ways of doing more um, interesting types of uh, retopologize.